This is a common gate cold pitch reflection oscillator that oscillates at 18 gigahertz. Some of the characteristics of this circuit are the use of a transmission line in the base and the use of a resonator which looks like a capacitor at the oscillation frequency but it is a resonator at a much lower frequency and therefore it is not an ordinary capacitor at our oscillation frequency and we'll see why we use that later on. The oscillator we are looking at is a cold pits oscillator. What is shown here is a cold pits feedback oscillator. We see the cold pits network in the feedback path. Characteristics are that we have a capacitor at the fedback point, another capacitor at the output, both of those are in shunt, and then there is an inductor connecting the output back to the input. Now we want to marry that Colpitz oscillator with a common gate configuration. The common gate configuration is shown here. It's fairly easy to see that this is a common gate and if we replace the MOSFET by a BJT we would call it a, a common base but it's the same circuit. Z3 this element Z3 is our feedback element it becomes our inductor. Z1 is a capacitor and Z2 is a capacitor. When this cold pits feedback network is used in a feedback amplifier the frequency of oscillation can be derived by noting that C1 and C2 charge up and then discharge through L3 to complete an RF cycle. So the frequency of oscillation is given by 1 over 2 pi times the square root of L times the square root of the total capacitance. And the total capacitance is made up of C1 in series with C2. And the formula for calculating that capacitance is the inverse of 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. That feedback network is not immediately seen with a transistor. And a better way of looking at the Colpitt's feedback network in a transistor configuration is shown on the top right there. What we have is the output from our active device is across L3 and then there's a feedback point such as into the base of an amplifier that is between C1 and C2. The key thing is that C1 and C2 charge up through part of the cycle and then discharge through L3. Or another way of looking at this is that L3 is intrinsic to our feedback path. It is connected to the output to ground or maybe you could look at it as being connected between the output of a transistor and the input of the transistor. In a common gate Colpitz oscillator configuration this is how those elements would appear. The output of this amplifier is the drain here and the input is going to be the source because the gate is held at an RF short circuit. There may be other elements that apply bias but we will use large capacitors and large inductors to in the case of the large capacitors to provide an RF short circuit in the case of large inductors to provide an RF open circuit and we'll use those where needed. Now VDD is also RF ground so L3 is across C1 and C2 so it's pretty easy here to see the transistor configuration of the Colpitz feedback network used in the common gate form. L3 is between the output and ground and the feedback point is between C1 and C2 and is attached to the source. And let's talk about some of the attributes of this circuit. One of the attributes 
is that the parasitic capacitances of the active device are incorporated into the coal pit's feedback elements. So the drain source capacitance and any capacitance that's associated with the source on its own are incorporated in C1 and C2. We like that because that means that the parasitic elements of the transistor are not going to resonate separately from the coal pit's feedback network because if they resonated separately and if we had several resonant frequencies we could potentially have oscillation at multiple frequencies or what we call multi-frequency oscillation. So this configuration, the common gate coal pits configuration, naturally incorporates the parasitic elements in the elements we're going to have for the coal pits feedback system. This aids in stability as well. So reducing the number of discrete separate resonant elements in our network avoids the possibility of multiple possible solutions to the oscillation problem. One of the results of that is that we achieve periodic output. So this periodic signal ideally would be a sine wave but usually we have some harmonics in it. And it avoids an output which is chaotic. If an amplifier becomes unstable we usually do not achieve a nice single frequency oscillation we usually achieve chaos. And what chaos means is that the output will vary, but it will not vary periodically. It'll vary in what looks like a periodic waveform, but it's not quite periodic. So we cannot build an oscillator simply by building an unstable amplifier. We have to pay particular attention to the feedback networks. Now that's not in the form of the oscillator that we're going to design here. So here is the conventional form for the common gate coal pits oscillator. We have a feedback output. That feedback output, there is that point there, that feedback output is fed to the source. And L3 appears as if it is in parallel with C1 and C2 because VD, our supply voltage rail here, is RF ground. So L3 is in parallel with C1, C2. This common gate coal pits oscillator is a direct implementation of the coal pits feedback form. The type of oscillator we're going to consider is shown at the bottom right here. This is called a modified common base coal pits oscillator, but very commonly it is called a common base coal pits oscillator and this is getting closer to the form of the oscillator that we're going to design here. Some characteristics here are the use of this inductor in the base network. That inductor is the L3, that is this inductance here. That is the L3 in the classic formulation of the coal pits transistor oscillator. Another characteristic is the use of this resonant circuit. Now that resonant circuit is resonant at a frequency far below the frequency of oscillation. Well, I shouldn't say far below. It could be resonant at a factor of 2 or 3 or 4 below the oscillation frequency. So here our oscillation frequency will be around about 18 gigahertz. And so that resonant circuit is going to be resonant around 3, 4, 5 gigahertz. We are not using this resonant circuit as a resonator to establish the oscillation frequency. We are using this resonator to present an effective capacitance, but we are going to manage the slope of the susceptance with respect to frequency of that effective capacitance. Turns out that that is a very important step to obtaining a state-of-the-art oscillator performance. This resonator network corresponds to C2 and we do not have an element that explicitly corresponds to C1. CB here is a DC blocking capacitor so it's mostly an RF short circuit. It blocks our DC current but we do have parasitic capacitance between the collector and the emitter and that becomes our C1. Now one of the characteristics of this circuit 
yet another characteristic is that the frequency is largely determined by the effective value of C2, not much by C1, and not much by the load. Now the reason why it's not affected by C1, that is this capacitance here, is that this is usually a fairly small capacitor. We make sure that our effective value of C2 is larger than C1. So the susceptance of C2 is greater than C1. The total capacitance is largely determined by C2. And that's the characteristic that we want. We would like the performance of our oscillator to be largely independent of the load. And that is why this modified common base Colpitts oscillator is so commonly chosen. Well, we need to make one little more transition to get to the oscillator that we want to work with. We're aiming for a frequency of around about 18 gigahertz. So here's the modified common base Colpitts oscillator. Very commonly, the modified term is just dropped out. Sometimes the Colpitts term is dropped out as well and it is simply called a common base reflection oscillator. And I will say that it is not clear that this is a common base configuration, but it is biased as though it's a common base circuit, because of course this LB inductance, the base inductance, looks like a DC short circuit. And you can go through a number of circuit manipulations to try and put this back into the Colpitts form. It is a bit of an exercise to do that, and it's not a perfect transition to the standard Colpitts form, but nevertheless we call this a Colpitts oscillator. On the right here is the topology of the circuit that we want to design. As with all circuit design, we must have a topology in mind before we start. One of the variants we have here is that we've included a transmission line in the base rather than an inductor. An inductor is going to be fairly lossy. It is going to contribute noise to our circuit. And since we're trying to build a circuit that operates at 18 gigahertz, it's fairly reasonable to use a transmission line. It is not too long. With that modification, we now have the circuit that we want to design. When we design, we want to know where we're going. We want to have some idea of where we're going. We've already made some choices in this design. One choice has been choosing a resonator, which is resonant at a frequency far below the oscillation frequency, and it is used to establish an effective capacitance where we can manage the slope. It is very difficult to design transistor oscillators using a two-port feedback network. Instead, we use the idea of reflection coefficients. So we're going to look at the reflection coefficient looking into the passive circuit, the resonator, and we're going to look at the reflection coefficient looking into the device. The reflection coefficient looking into the active device will depend on the level of the signal at the output, or another way of putting it, dependent on the level of the signal at X. And so to find gamma d, and especially gamma d at different power levels, we need to perform a harmonic balance analysis, and this is the circuit that we use. We establish a 50 ohm port at the source, and we will drive that source with signals of different power levels. And then we'll be able to look at gamma d at different power levels. So now our oscillator has been reduced to a one-port oscillator with a device having an admittance YD and a tank circuit having an admittance YR. We could call that tank circuit the resonator, if you like, but tank is shorter and it's commonly used. First of all, looking at the susceptance. Ideally, this is what we would like. We would like the susceptance of the active device to be independent of frequency. And we would like the only frequency dependent susceptance to be that of the tank circuit. When oscillation occurs, it'll occur where those two curves 
cross. The other part of the admittance is the conductance. Ideally we would like the conductance of the resonator to be independent of the amplitude. In addition we would like the susceptances to be independent of amplitude. For the linear circuit of course that will be the case. There's no way the susceptance can depend on amplitude. As for the active device, if the susceptance of the active device is zero, well then we do not have to worry about it. But if there is a susceptance, we want that susceptance to be independent of amplitude. The other part of the admittance is the conductance. Again, we would like these conductances to be independent of frequency. And for the linear element, of course, the conductance will be independent of amplitude. And what we find for transistor devices is that the negative of the conductance of the active device will reduce as amplitude increases. After all, our transistors are essentially transconductance devices. It is possible that we could configure a circuit that the negative of the conductance increases as amplitude increases, but those circuits are usually contrived and it's just not the natural way that the circuit behaves. When there is oscillation, oscillation will occur when those two curves cross. So GD depends on amplitude. So these two crossovers, the crossovers of the conductance and the crossovers of the susceptance, determine the power level and the oscillation frequency respectively. Here is our reflection oscillator with values very close to the final design values. Of course when we're doing the design we're going to gradually iterate towards a solution. The transmission line in the base provides feedback and you can see here that this line is about a sixteenth of a wavelength long. We've established the resonant frequency of our resonator at 3.188 gigahertz and in the final design our oscillator oscillates at 17.76 gigahertz. So that resonator looks effectively like a capacitance at the oscillation frequency. Now there is another element shown here which will not be in our final design. This element, the OS probe element, is used in simulation and it is used to establish the frequency of oscillation. So in harmonic balance we are going to separate the circuit into a nonlinear subcircuit and into a linear subcircuit and we iterate on the voltage phases at the interface to solve for the steady state solution of the problem. In oscillator design we do not have an external voltage source so instead we introduce this OS probe element. We vary the frequency of the OS probe element and we say that we've reached harmonic balance or steady state when the current that flows from the oscillator is equal to zero. So OSPROBE is introduced as an artifact of how we solve the harmonic balance problem. We're going to look at gamma D and gamma R. The portion of the circuit we're looking at is shown on the left. We're looking at gamma D and gamma R. And we're going to plot the results two ways. First of all, we will plot the admittance. So let's focus on the resonator to begin with. So we're looking at gamma R, that is we're looking at the admittance which is made up of GR and BR. GR is very small, that's of course what we would like. This resistance comes mostly from the series resistance of the inductor and we see that BR the susceptance of the resonator changes slightly with frequency. Now when we come to the active device, so now we're looking at gamma D. Gamma D relates to the admittance of the device and that admittance is made up of a conductance term and a susceptance term. So here we see that the conductance is varying with respect to frequency. Ideally we would like that conductance to be 
independent of frequency as much as possible? Well, I guess it doesn't change too much in the region where we will have oscillation. Oscillation eventually occurs around about here. And we see that the susceptance of the active device also changes with frequency. And here, the susceptance BD is really quite large. It's larger than the conductance itself. Ideally, we would like BD to be very close to zero. See, it turns out that if we want to build a very competitive design, this is a design that has low phase noise and produces a fairly large output power, we really want BD to be very close to zero. That gives us more degrees of freedom in our design. So getting back here, our oscillation is going to be about 17.76 gigahertz and that will be when the susceptance of the active device cancels out the susceptance of the resonator when those we find that with GD the amplitude of the oscillation signal builds up to get GD to go closer and closer to GR. So that's one perspective. When we're designing a reflection oscillator we need to look at both the admittance behavior and also the reflection coefficient behavior. Oscillator designers like to see the operation of their circuit on a polar plot, or on a Smith chart really. But a Smith chart has a unit circle of 1, at least that's our conventional Smith chart, and the reflection coefficients that we need to deal with with an oscillator can have a magnitude greater than 1. Our active device should look like a negative resistor, at least at low signal levels or when the waveform across the device is small. Then the magnitude of that reflection coefficient should reduce as the signal level, the waveform across the active device, becomes larger. Recall that at oscillation, gamma d times gamma r is equal to 1. That is, gamma d is equal to 1 over gamma r. If we plot gamma r on the Smith chart, we must also plot 1 over gamma r, and it is the intersection of gamma d and 1 over gamma r that establishes the level of oscillation and the frequency of oscillation. And that must occur at the same point. Now this does not occur by accident. It occurs because of judicious design. Recall that anything above this line is inductive and anything below is capacitive. So our resonator is presenting a capacitive impedance and our active device is presenting a positive reactance or an inductance. There is a lot of information on this chart. First of all, gamma d rotates clockwise with respect to frequency. So here's our low frequency end of 15 gigahertz and then we move up to 20 gigahertz. That clockwise rotation is what we expect. Gamma R also rotates clockwise with respect to frequency. And 1 over Gamma R rotates counterclockwise with respect to frequency. So the locus of Gamma D and the locus of Gamma R are rotating in opposite directions. That is what we want in our oscillator design. By doing that, we are going to reduce the noise of our oscillator and we're also going to reduce the chances of oscillation occurring at two frequencies simultaneously. It is the intersection of gamma d and 1 over gamma r at a single point that establishes single frequency oscillation. And that crossover for this design occurs at 17.76 gigahertz and a power level of minus 6 dBm. Now I want to zoom in so we can talk about what is happening at that intersection region in more detail. Here we're looking at just that upper left hand corner of the Smith chart or the polar plot. Look at gamma d. Gamma d has a magnitude which is fairly large when the signal level is small, minus 20 dBm. As the signal level increases, gamma d becomes smaller and smaller. Now let's turn our attention to 1 over gamma r. In a fixed frequency oscillator, there is very little resistance, there is very little loss. So the reflection coefficient looking into the resonator will have a magnitude very close to 1. In this case we cannot even tell the difference. It really looks as though the magnitude of gamma r 
the magnitude of 1 over gamma r is equal to 1, and this is our unit circle. Now gamma d and gamma r are rotating in opposite directions, which is really what we want for a good oscillator design. Gamma d is in the top half of the polar plot, top half of the Smith chart, and so this indicates that the impedance looking into our active device is inductive. 1 over gamma r looks inductive. Of course, 1 over that, which is just gamma r, will be capacitive, just as we saw on the rectangular plots. But it's not enough just to have a capacitor forming our resonator and relying on the inductance of our active device. We really want to control the slope of the admittance. Yes, we do want a net capacitance to appear looking into that circuit, but we also want to control the derivative with respect to frequency of that circuit, and that is more critical if there's appreciable loss in the resonator. Again, crossover occurs at 17.76 GHz and minus 6 dBm. One of the questions we could have, or you could have, is how can we be assured that when this line the blue line, the locus of gamma d, is on this unit circle that we will have oscillation at exactly 17.76 gigahertz. Well, it turns out that the locus here of gamma d depends on the harmonic loading conditions as well. And if our oscillator is good, we find that as we get close to the oscillation condition, the levels of the harmonics change, the phase of the induced impedance at the fundamental frequency changes and they kind of lock in. In a good design they lock in. We are using harmonic balance analysis. We want to check on the characteristics of the reflection coefficient loci as we did on the last chart and we also want to look at the waveforms. Here are the voltage waveforms at two points. One point, shown in blue, which is across our tank circuit. And you can see that the waveform is pretty close to being sinusoidal there. And that is what we expect. At the source, shown in red here, we see that we have a periodic signal, but there is some harmonic content. Most likely we would want to follow this circuit by a bandpass filter. Out of band, that bandpass filter will look like a reactance. In band, we will see through the bandpass filter and we will see the load. But out of band, it will look like a reactance. And that reactance could affect the way our oscillator behaves. So we probably want to precede that bandpass filter with an attenuator. We're almost certainly going to have an attenuator in addition to a bandpass filter just so that we reduce the sensitivity to the load. Because our load will not just be a resistor, it will also have capacitance associated with it. Another characteristic that we want to check on when we're building our oscillator is the phase noise. Ideally, an oscillator would have no noise. If we looked at the spectrum at the output of the oscillator, there would be a single impulse. But in fact, the Oscillation frequency will move around a little bit, it will dither around a little bit, and there would be amplitude noise as well as phase noise. However, our oscillator saturates. We have an active element that saturates, and that tends to get rid of low levels of amplitude noise, but it doesn't get rid of phase noise. And so phase noise is our biggest concern. Phase noise is not well understood but we have to live with it anyway. We measure phase noise as the phase noise in a unit bandwidth, usually 1 hertz, offset from the carrier. So we call the stable average oscillation frequency of our oscillator, the carrier, and then we look at the offset from it. So phase noise is expressed in terms of dBc, that is decibels with respect to the carrier, per hertz. Generally, we take 1 megahertz as a frequency which enables us to compare different oscillators. And we have a phase noise here, which is around about minus 105 dBc 
per hertz. So that's not too bad. We can do a little bit better than that. Residual phase noise is coming from the fact that we have inductors in our circuit, primarily from that source. And so replacing the resonator by a transmission line based resonator would probably improve our phase noise a little bit. Now I will summarize the attributes of this oscillator. This is a Colpitt's common base oscillator, often just called a reflection oscillator. The inductor here is primarily a choke inductor and should have no effect on the performance of our circuit. We would really like the performance of our oscillator to be fairly independent of the output network. Of course L1 cannot be a perfect RF open circuit and so it will have some slight effect. The transmission line in the base, which replaces an inductor that we would use at a lower frequency, provides feedback and induces a negative conductance looking into the source of the transistor. Another characteristic of this circuit is the use of a resonator. The resonator enables the slope of the admittance looking into what amounts to an effective capacitance at the source to be controlled. A third attribute is that the resonator is isolated from the load, so the load has limited effect on the resonant frequency. And usually we need to follow the output with an attenuator, but always we will use a bandpass filter to get rid of some of the harmonics before we use the oscillator 